welcome. Thank you very much. I am here uh, among you, and uh, despite all, I feel at home. I am here in your conference. I know you are the real partner for peace. You have been, and you continue to be. You have been a real partner for a very long time, and I have really worked uh, with, with those uh, giants who uh, established your party and made it always a, an important factor for peace. You were the party that enabled Rabin from forming his first government that signed peace with the Palestinians. You had 16 members of Knesset then, and you will regain this and even more. We will have 16 now, then we have 12. <laughs> 12? Okay, you will get uh, 22 this time. <laughs> so, uh, really, I had uh, so many friends that I remember all the time, from Shilawit Aloni to Yossi Sari to Ron Cohen to... Uh, Galia Golan, he's among you here, uh, and of course, Zahava Galon, and so many, Mordechai Baron, and so many of uh, the good people who re really made it possible for us to start the peace process, they, they were all uh, your people. And uh, that is why, you know, it is very difficult for our people to come to Tel Aviv. Uh, it's not easy, believe me. And uh, I, but, uh, I'm, I'm ready to take all the, the difficulties uh, because it's you. Now, I want to start really, I'm, I don't want to be a historian, uh, but I want to start with the past. I, I want to really uh, just bring back to your memory those of you and of us who really worked hard for peace. And I want you to think back of the fact that peace did work in 1994. It did work. It, it, that peace is not a hallucination. That peace is not a dream that can only be achieved uh, uh, in day-night in day -night dreaming. And uh, because day-night, uh, day, I mean daydreaming uh, is more controllable than night dream. You cannot decide what you will, you will see at night. But somehow, at the daytime, you can dream while you are awake. And uh, your dreams can come true or can be totally out of uh, sync with reality. No, peace is not a daydream. Uh, peace happened. It, it became possible. And it happened because there are people on your side and on our side who worked very hard to make it happen. Uh, I. I uh, modestly uh, did my part all through my lifetime to make peace possible. I remember a lot of my ideas came while I was a, a teacher at the Wharton School of Finance, the University of Pennsylvania, where no less than 80% of my students were Jewish Americans. Uh, most of them children of stockbrokers from New York and uh, very rich, very rich people. But the professors, uh, again, uh, quite a majority of them were Jewish Americans, were the most liberal, uh, which is really, in my mind, uh, that is a lie when you say that the problem with American policy is the Jewish community in the United States. This is not true, absolutely not true. The Jewish community in the United States is by far the most progressive group of people in the United States, the most educated, the most in, uh, interested in, uh, in, in human rights. Of course, uh, there, there are organizations in America that, uh, uh, that take the side of Israel, whether Israel is right or wrong. But believe me, that is not what determines 
the, the voting pattern of uh, Jewish Americans. And today, if any of you have attended J Street's last convention, you could really see, see how the young Jewish Americans are really the most progressive in the peace process than their Christian Americans of the same age and of the same group. Uh, and I, I could, uh, in 1969, I published three articles about the Holocaust in Arabic. Uh, very few people, if, if any, had ever published anything about the Holocaust. And I felt, I felt it was absolutely necessary. If you want to make peace with uh, uh, Jews in Israel, you have to tell your people they are not exactly like British occupiers and French occupiers and, and German occupiers and Portuguese occupiers, that they have passed through the world's worst genocide. And they are seeking asylum. They are seeking a, a, a homeland. And you, we can share that homeland. It's a, a very special homeland. It's a holy land. But uh, we, we can share it nevertheless. And therefore, I felt that Palestinians in general, and, and, and in particular, and, gen, and Arabs in general, need to know more about the agony and the, and the, and the, 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 the pain that uh, Jews in the world have went through. I'm not talking about how to make to, to utilize that agony uh, uh, in, 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 in making policy, but in appreciating the human nature of the, of the Jewish agony during the Holocaust. On that, I based the idea of a one democratic uh, state uh, for Jews and Arabs, Christians and Muslims. And uh, for three or four years, my work was basically on how do you make peace in a one state with uh, freedom of religion and, and worship, but uh, uh, political uh, democracy and, and all of that. The only answer I got was from then the Secretary General of Histadrut, uh, Arye uh, Le uh, Eliav, uh, Luva, I think they called him, Luva Eliav, and uh, he sent it to me via a, a Dutch uh, monk, a Dutch uh, Christian uh, clergyman, and basically what he said I like your idea very much and, and your humanity, and uh, I think it's a good idea, but we have to start first with two states. And when the two states work, we can confederate, federate, whatever, and we can really follow the model that the Europeans have done after years of enmity uh, between them. I like that. I like that. And gradually, I had to shift to the two-state policy. I thought that a one state looks very ideal and looks very democratic. Uh, uh, why not? America is a state that just looks like that. And uh, South Africa now is a state that just looks like that. And I think what uh, Mr. Mandela has done uh, is, is amazing. Because after these years of apartheid, Mandela never allowed white uh, apartheid to replace black apartheid. And he was able with his love and his uh, real adoption of, of love between his people to maintain the whites of, of South Africa. Very few of them have actually immigrated out of South Africa. And you know what? It was the Jewish community in South Africa that played a very important part in that. They were in the whites the group that joined the ANC through the Communist Party of South Africa, uh, which really, I think, made it possible for Mr. Mandela and the leadership of ANC to make this a multicolored revolution against racism and apartheid. And then in 1973, we started really talking about the two-state solution and the possibility of accepting Resolution 242 and of uh, 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 going through the, 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 the real concession of accepting that Israel will take much more than what the partition plan has given her, which is 78% uh, instead of 54% uh, uh, of Palestine. But that's a fact of life. You'll have to accept it. And we'll work on the idea of a two states on the West Bank and Gaza uh, and, and, and Israel. And in 19, uh, actually, if, if you go from uh, uh, 1973, you can really go to 1982 during the, uh, the siege of Beirut and the massacre of Sabra and Shatila. 400,000 Jewish Israelis went down the street to protest Sabra and Shatila. Not one Arab country had the same. Uh, There was the birth of peace now. 
and then the Intifada came in 1987, and Women in Black and Peace Now, and so many protest organizations sprang. And it was really these people that made it possible a year later to go on to the Declaration of Algeria, where we recognized the right of the State of Israel to exist, where we recognized uh, Resolution 242, we recognized that we have to abandon uh, violence completely and that to have to build two states. It became a very concrete... Uh, in 1989, I don't know how many of you attended the Columbia Road for Peace conference. Any of you? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, we're getting old. <laughs> so, so uh, in 1989, in January of 1989, the Columbia Road to Peace was a hootenanny. I mean, it was really a, uh, a, a conference of love. I mean, it was the first time uh, official Palestinians and semi-official Israelis. I mean, Shalamit Aloni was not a minister then, but I mean, she was an Israeli leader. Uh, Yossi Sarid and uh, so many others were there. And uh, it, what, what was a very tense beginning uh, turned out into an, an, open, an open love fest that it is possible to really live together. And uh, I felt that the, the, the Columbia Road to Peace did to normalization what 30 years of peace with, between Egypt and Israel never succeeded to do. Uh, and, and therefore, I, we all felt that peace is just around the corner. Well, it took the whole war of the Gulf in 1990 uh, and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 to bring Mr. Uh, Baker, uh, trotting to Palestine. And uh, out of that, the Madrid conference was born. And uh, it's a very, very interesting. It's unfair to compare Mr. Baker to Mr. Kerry. I mean, uh, Mr. Kerry spent eight months to define the terms of reference, the rules of the game, in very important way. I've never seen it done before. Writing letters of assurances to each party and giving each party the letters he gave to the other party as well. So there was nothing hidden under the table. It was an open sort of uh, preparation. And then he negotiated the letter of invitation to the conference so that everybody knew exactly where to start. There was, it's impossible to think that you can negotiate the terms of reference in a negotiating arena. How can you, how can you neg negotiate law? How can you negotiate uh, aspirations? How can you negotiate end results? You, you negotiate how to get there. You negotiate how to make out of the odds, how to bring the two the together to a, meet, to a middle position. But you cannot negotiate the terms. I mean, it's really like playing uh, 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 basketball or football, and the, the stronger team, every time starts a game, says, ah, ah, but we've changed the rules. Uh, you either come and negotiate the new rules with us or accept our rule uh, that we can kick the hell out of you and you cannot kick back. We can hold the hand, the ball in our hand. You can only uh, shoot it with your, with your, with your foot. Uh, you cannot do that. Terms of reference are based on international law, on past agreements, on so many things that make it possible for two people or two countries to <laughs> fell down. <laughs> OK. Anyway, we went to Madrid and from Madrid to Washington. By the time we got to Washington, it was too late for Mr. Bush and Mr. Baker. It was election time, and we ran. We found the Americans incapable of doing it, so we went to Norway. And uh, Oslo became the trademark for uh, the, a peace process. But you see, Oslo is, is not just uh, the skill of the Norwegians. And obviously, we are very grateful to the Norwegians. What they have tried to do uh, is really tremendous. And I think it was the only agreement that really worked. I mean, all other agreements either was never reached or never implemented. But the Oslo agreement worked. First of all, it was Rabin and Arafat. And the two had fought each other, but the two had decided to make peace with each other. And secondly, 
It was as a result, really, of the changes in the world, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the Gulf War, the changes in power relationships. All of these were have to be taken into consideration. But the, this, the decision to, to make Oslo work was miraculous, was really miraculous. I, I remember uh, when uh, Bill Clinton came to hug me, and I was not sitting on the stage, I, I was in the first uh, row, where he came to hug me and to congratulate me, and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Clinton, you have not lost uh, an Israeli daughter, you just won a Palestinian son. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so it, was, it became possible, it became possible to move from that to what really looked miraculous. Yasser Arafat did his best to make it possible for Rabin to stop over in Casablanca and to meet the king of Morocco in Casablanca. It was the very first time an open public reception of an Israeli prime minister in an Arab country. And he arranged for him his first visit to Indonesia, to Jakarta, Indonesia. And step by step, things were sprouting all over the place, as if peace had been there for a long time. Uh, kids from Jewish kibbutzim around uh, Gaza would come to spend the overnight in a Gaza refugee camp, and refugee children would go the next week and spend their night in the kibbutzim. The, 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 the uh, organization of bereaved families, families that lost people in the war, were coming together and thinking of ideas. The, the children of Abraham organization, the, all kinds of efforts were made to make this peace this peace work. And it would be an, an absolute tragedy if you think it did not work. It did work. Israel moved from a 2% rate of growth in one year to a 14% rate of growth. It was the birth of your high-tech industry. In effect, the signing of the Oslo Agreement. The recognitions that came to, the, to Israel as a result of Madrid and the and the uh, Oslo Agreement included the first recognition by China, the first recognition by India, and, the, and so many return of other African and Asian countries that have cut their relationship with Israel after the war of 1973. It was the influx of, of, of capital to develop your, your, your industry. It was also an, the, the beginning of Palestinian institution building for the first time, building in state buildings rather than a revolutionary uh, sort of buildings. Uh, we, we built an airport, we were building a harbor, we built a high-tech uh, stock exchange in, uh, in Nablus, eight new universities, hospitals, roads, and everywhere. In fact, we, in 1994, was a, 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 a deficitary state. But in, 19, in 1950, wait a minute, 1998, we had our first budget with no deficit in the, period, in, the, uh, the, in the current expenditures. I mean, we got money for projects, but there was no needed to put money for the budget to, for, for current expenses. We are still up till now, we return to a situation where we cannot pay our current expenses. We cannot pay our wages without the foreign aid that, that comes. But in 1998, uh, uh, we were totally out of debt for current expenditure. And in 1999, we had an 8% rate of growth, net growth, after taking price rises into, into, into consideration. And in the year 2000, the first six months of the year 2000, our net rate of growth was 14%. We, we were growing and we were developing. We had an election, we had a, a legislative council, we had uh, security forces, we had uh, uh, industries in, in, in Gaza, there was a real uh, industrial zone, and in Tul Karim, a high-tech industrial zone. And uh, I, I did go, actually, I had an excellent friend, Stanley Scheinbaum, in California, who introduced me to the Jewish community, the, the Jewish American and Israeli American community in the high-tech industry in California. And we were talking about joint interest in investment in high technology. Israel was going to India to get uh, uh, software and was going to Cyprus and to Hungary and Romania to get software when there were thousands of so software writers in the Palestinian economy. So really, no, no, peace was possible. My first visit to Jaffa, the city I remember uh, after, uh, before 1948, 
came when I had a visit to Tel Aviv, and, and I, I was in the, the Ministry of Defense in Tel Aviv with the, the late dear friend of mine, Amnon Lipkin Chahak, who just died a few, few months ago. And uh, uh, I went to Tel Aviv, and from Tel Aviv I said, I want to go to, to, to Jaffa. They said, you cannot go to Jaffa, you cannot risk it. And, and they sent with me six military cars to protect, uh, to protect me in Jaffa, believe it or not. And yet, they were amazed because I was offered cups of tea and coffee from Jews and, and, and Arabs alike. And there was absolutely not one incident of somebody shouting at me or, or, or anything like that. My first uh, uh, airplane ride was from Ben Gurion Airport, and the American consul took me with his car to the, uh, to the airplane itself. So I didn't have to go through all of this. And I went up that that plane and everybody crowded with their menus asking me to sign them, uh, uh, long live peace or something like that. So no, I, I say peace, we saw peace work, it can work to the interest of both people. I mean, I don't want to, to bother you with the details, but we were talking about joint energy projects, returning the pipelines from Saudi Arabia and Iraq and the Gulf. But, and, and it will go in a branch, a branch would go to Gaza and another would go to Ashdod and we will s split 50-50 the, tra the transport of uh, Arab oil into the Mediterranean. Uh, it was then Moshe Shahal, who was the Minister of uh, uh, Energy, uh, together with the Interior Minister. We talked about tourism. I had a plan of 60 million tourists to come to Israel and the West Bank when there is a real uh, freedom of pilgrimage and a real pre uh, freedom of people to visit. But, unfortunately, we are in a totally different situation today. We are in a situation in, in which uh, 20 years have passed, and we are still in the interim stage. I mean, I remember discussions with Rabin. I remember discussions with many uh, of, of, of Israeli leaders. Why do we have to go through an interim stage and then go to a permanent stage? And they said, well, this will be a preparatory period. We get to know each other. This is a trust-building uh, period. But it didn't. It didn't. As things change, people change. And the enemies of peace on both sides will really use any change in the environment to try to bring us back to where we were before. Uh, and that's particularly uh, important when the occupier has people inside his occupying that are against any solution based on a two-state or any other solution, really, for that matter, except the solution of power. And, uh, and as a result, uh, we have been 20 years in interimness, that is, in an interim agreement. What does an interim agreement mean? It means that we carry the cost of running the government, when somebody else makes all the gains for free. I mean, you have 91% of our water is used by the settlers uh, uh, from the West Bank, and 9% is used by all the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza. 62% of the land is still called Area C, and it's totally used by the, uh, the Israelis, and, and really we cannot uh, do it in touch it. And building anything there gets destroyed anyway. You get, you're losing East Jerusalem gradually, bit by bit. I remember coming in 1994. I don't recognize Sheikh Jarrah today. I don't recognize Wadi Jews. I don't recognize the, the Jerusalem I saw in 1994. It's changed totally, completely. Settlers, it's very interesting. I get you the numbers here. 1967, obviously, was zero settlers. In 1979, which is 12 years later, there was only 6,000 settlers. In 1988, 180,000 settlers. In 1993, 260,000 settlers. In the year 2000, they became 400,000 settlers. Today, there are 550,000 settlers. And in the last nine months of negotiations, 10,000 homes were, were, were built, which can accommodate 40 to 50,000 new settlers. And therefore, what you are really seeing is a situation in which you are denied control of your resources, you are denied access, somebody else decides where, where for you to go and where not to go and when to go and how to go, and uh, uh, the, the, the exercise of sovereignty is uh, totally taken away, and uh, you are to, to pay 
the price of, of, uh, of security, you have to pay the price of roads, you have to pay the price of everything. And you have to run begging the Europeans to, to pay you some more and the Americans to pay you some more in order to, to pay those expenses. Uh, that's why you, know, you hear about ending the Palestinian Authority and all of that, because this is really a, a, a situation of total loss. Whatever you do, you are losing. I was in London about two weeks ago uh, attending one of uh, President Carter's uh, sessions, and I said, uh, we, are fine. We, are, we are off the hook. We have kicked the habit. Uh, we are leaving the casino of gambling called negotiations. Uh, a casino in which you lose. I mean, gamblers always lose anyway. I mean, the long run, <laughs> gamblers cannot, cannot wait. But in particular, when you really have the casino run by a casino older owner called the United States, and that casino owner has a very uh, favorite customer called the government of Israel, and between the two, they change the rules every time you go to gamble. It's impossible for you to, to win. It's impossible for you to come quits. You keep losing all the time. And, and that is really a, a situation which has destroyed our credibility among our people. What the hell are you doing? You've been doing this for 20 years. And, and, and they, 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 the Israeli uh, pol uh, polit politicians who do it, when, they, when, they, when the negotiations succeed, they are still there, and they are gaining more land. And, you, and when the uh, negotiations fail, they are still there, enjoying their life. And you are losing both cases. Whether you make an agreement or don't make an agreement, you're losing. And, and that is really a situation you don't want to be in with your own people, let alone with the, with the, with the outside world. And therefore, really, I have to... Uh, of course, I mean, there are other things that, for example, the attack on Palestinian individuals in the last nine, nine, nine months. Uh, there were 60 Palestinians killed, most of them really unprovoked, including that Jordanian judge at the border, I mean, really with very little provocation. There was attack on, on refugee camps for the first time, three refugee camps, uh, one in Ramallah and, and, and one in Jenin and one in Bethlehem, Aida camp, that were attacked for no reason. I mean, we are doing uh, uh, security... Uh, 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 coordination. We are keeping the security. I mean, why the hell then do we keep the security? If you are going to bust, uh, uh, despite our our role and our responsibility, refugee camps and other places in order to uh, to arrest people or to do this or to do that, it is it is not really a, a very happy situation, uh, economically, politically, in any other way. I mean. Uh, uh, I recently, they, they, they gave me back the right to travel, uh, but for a year and a half, I could not even come to Tel Aviv. I could not uh, go to Jerusalem. And uh, going through the Jericho with uh, the LMB bridge with a bus, uh, it's not a bus, it's six buses. You have to go through and get searched four times in order just to go across the bridge because we cannot go to Ben Gurion. I used to be a VIP in Ben Gurions, and, uh, and I used to really go to Ben Gurion without any. Uh, the things now have become just impossible, and the situation in Gaza is really beyond belief. No water, no energy, no roads, no access, no no life, no employment. Things cannot go on this way. Therefore, Mr. Kerry has has done his his best, I believe, but he was not supported. I mean, 28 of your 68 Knesset members of the coalition are against a Palestinian state. It's not a question that they have worries about it. 20, and I have my name, their names here, if you are interested. They are, they are publicly on the record as being against a two-state solution. So, I mean, how do you expect this government to be able to Come one step forward. Ah, you always, you always hear, we shall make painful concessions. <laughs> and you, you don't hear anything. I mean, uh, what are these painful and what are these concessions? I mean, uh, you are there. And therefore, I have to really, in order to keep your and mine sanity and optimism, <laughs> I, I have to, to, to tell you what can work and what cannot work what we are going to do and what we are not going to do. One, I think it has to be clear that we have sought to separate the negotiable issues and the unnegotiable issues, or the non-negotiable issues. The negotiable issues have been defined in 1993, namely 
borders, Jerusalem, refugees, security, settlements, and water. These are the issues that we have to negotiate. But these are the issues that we have to negotiate only. We are not willing to negotiate anything else. And let me tell you what are the other things that we will not negotiate. One, we will not negotiate our right to self-determination. It's, it's not, not, none, in no time ever that we, we negotiated with Israel did we negotiate that we have a right to self-determination or not. And therefore, we have the right to decide that we want a state or not, so long that it is on the border of 67. Because if we talk about a state on the border of 67, this means reaffirming our recognition of Israel on the border of 1967. It's not to replace Israel. It's not to take anything from Israel. It's to be allowed the right of statehood and the right to seek support and recognition of that state. This is not negotiable. It was never in the Oslo Agreement. It was never in any agreement. OK. Thirdly, we really should not negotiate our geographical unity with Gaza. And to that, if Israel does not really have the right to tell us you can unite with your brothers in Gaza or you cannot unite with your brothers in Gaza. I just had a question on coming in. And I said, if Mr. Netanyahu thinks it's kosher to have an, uh, an agreement with uh, Hamas on uh, 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 what they call tahdi'ah, which is uh, a ceasefire, and he used Hillary Clinton and uh, Mr. Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt, uh, to do it. And if he negotiates for the exchange of Shalit and he uses the Egyptians and the Germans to do it, if it's OK to do that for Mr. Netanyahu, then it's definitely OK for us to negotiate what would bring our people together and will end the misery of our people in Gaza, a misery that will continue. <laughs> And, and I assure you, we will end that misery. And that unity uh, in Gaza will be, in effect, immediately going into a democratic choice of our people. And if they join, if Hamas joins the PLO, it has to join it with all its commitments. They cannot join a, P a PLO of their own. It has commitments, and Abu Mazen have shown really his consistency to the commitments he has made and we have made all along to make that peace, be, that peace work. He will end the militias uh, in the streets like what you see today in Syria and what you see in Libya and other places. And there will be one security organization. <laughs> and, and therefore, I, I, I really see absolutely no reason whatsoever why anybody would be against the unity of the Palestinians because this is end catch 22 of Mr. Netanyahu. He would say, uh, I don't think we can make an agreement with you while you are not controlling Gaza because you will not be able to deliver and implement that agreement in Gaza. So we say, all right, we will unite with Gaza and we will be in charge of, ah, but you cannot really make an agreement if you unite with Gaza. <laughs> so uh, this, this really will have to end. We need access to our natural resources. It cannot really be like this. I mean, Area C will have to be uh, at least back to the, the exploitation and the, the, the rightful ownership by Palestinians who own their land in Area C to build their houses, to, to grow their, their. And the gas, the gas in, in, in Gaza has to be pumped out. And I think the, the best market for it is Israel itself, but it has to be a Palestinian gas that we make use of it. The, so is the water, I mean, it, and, and, the, and the freedom of access. Uh, and finally, our human rights. I mean, human rights cannot be negotiated. All right, now that brings us to uh, another issue. And that is what we are going to do in the future. <laughs> Can I get some water? <laughs> I have to go underground. <laughs> if, if Meretz wins, let's say, 16 members in the next elections, <laughs> And 
labor at least gets what it has today or even more, then we, I'll trash this piece of paper. <laughs> and uh, we should be able to get back to negotiations very soon. And you, will, you and us will fulfill a dream, particularly those oldies like me who have been working in this for a very long time, is to really die happily. Uh, because really, it's frustrating for my children to keep asking me, Daddy, you've been doing this for 50 years or so. Uh, I'm just 55, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, and if you, you've got to really show something for all of that. Uh, I think a, a government in Israel, which is once again topped by merits and the parties who want peace, will make life easy for all of us, Palestinians and Israelis, and therefore there is no need to look for alternatives. If this, and we'll keep my, my fingers crossed, if this doesn't work, then we have to really uh, go into those measures that would make the government of Israel, whether it's Mr. Netanyahu or somebody else, think seriously about a coalition that can at least make progress. Two, think seriously about the cost of not reaching an agreement. Today, there is zero cost for not reaching an agreement. Everything is fine. Uh, whether we reach an agreement or not, we're still occupying the land of the Palestinians. The Palestinians are responsible for security. They have to deliver. And we can complain that, uh, if they don't. And we can even go and occupy and arrest in, in, in the Palestinian territory. So we are, we, we are, we're fine. We, we have no, nothing to lose. And therefore, we have to at least make the government of Israel feel that it's not only a gain to make peace, but there will be loss of not getting there. I think this, this lack of uh, parallelism to the Palestinians and Israelis have, have made all, all the difference. And therefore, we will go to the United Nations, and we will ask countries in the world to recognize the state of Palestine. <laughs> And, and we will make it hard for the Israeli government to uh, somehow think that the world can be the same and they don't even have to look seriously upon the, the, the results of looking like the party that is really making it impossible to reach peace. And therefore, our policy to all what I'm going to, to describe are non-violent means of changing the balance in order to make it possible. <laughs> we are going to re reunite with Gaza, and we will spend a lot of effort to reshape our organization, Fatah, in order to be able to run Gaza and the West Bank for peace and for prosperity of the Palestinians and for a better future and for the hope that this peace will bring what I, we've always dreamt about and we saw in 1994 and 1995. That's where I started. Uh, and then we hope that in the meanwhile, the things that can change, uh, the things that the first change will have to be here in Israel. Because a change in Israel is what really happened in this peace process. You remember that the man who went to Madrid was not Mr. Rabin, was Mr. Shabir. And by the way, I'll remind you of something he said after being pushed and pushed and pushed by the, by the Americans. He said, all right, I'll go to Madrid and I will continue to negotiation for 10 years. And after 10 years, there will be 500,000 uh, settlers in the West Bank. There'll be nothing to negotiate came out true. That's, that's exactly what, what is the result, is this prophecy of, of Mr. Shamir. But once there was a beginning of this peace process, and once really the Israeli people start feeling that there might be something really good for Israel if we go to, to a peace process, and not only for the Palestinians, Mr. Rabin took over the Labour Party, if you remember. And then two months later, or three months later, there was an election in which Labour won, but only with the 12, I'm sorry to, to correct, the 12 members of, of Meretz and the four Arab uh, party representatives. 
And Rabin, with that thin but strong majority, was able to make the peace process work. So it is not impossible. It's doable. And I assure you, we will continue our commitment to go back to negotiations and to build that peace process together if we avoid the mistakes that was, were committed in the last negotiations. Settlements have to stop. There is no other. No way. And the right of the Palestinian people to live in real uh, security and happiness is something that I'm sure is something that you will also appreciate for your own people and for our people. And then we will go to negotiate a clearly defined terms for a two states side by side in peace and harmony and cooperation. And we will be able to resolve all the outstanding issues that we have so that we can get a situation where the conflict ends and we move towards the future. It looks diff difficult today. It doesn't look possible immediately tomorrow, but it's doable and we will have to work together to make it happen. Thank you very much.